So welcome to Unit 8, Motivation, Emotion, and Stress. And this is Module 43, Stress and Illness. It's kind of a long one. Um, and if you are just joining uh, this playlist on this channel, these modules correspond, they align with Myers Psychology for the AP Course 3rd Edition. They're actually the lecture slides that came with the textbook. Um, so the learning targets. Discuss how our appraisal of an event affects our stress reaction and describe the three main types of stressors. Discuss how we respond and adapt to stress. Discuss how stress makes us more vulnerable to disease. Explain why some of us are more prone than others to coronary heart disease. And finally, discuss whether stress actually causes illness. So consider this story. Imagine being 21-year-old Ben Carpenter, who experienced the world's wildest and fastest wheelchair ride. As he crossed the street, the light changed and a semi-truck started moving into the intersection. When they bumped, Ben's wheelchair handles got stuck in the truck's grill. The driver, who hadn't seen Ben and couldn't hear his cries for help, took off down the highway, pushing the wheelchair at 50 miles per hour until reaching his destination two miles away. From the audio recording of a 911 caller reporting Ben Carpenter's distress, you're not gonna believe this. There is a semi truck pushing a guy in a wheelchair on Red Arrow Highway. Okay, there's an image of it. That was probably unbelievably, unbelievable amounts of extreme stress on that poor individual. So when we think about stress, that's an extreme example we just went over, but what is stress? It's the process by which we perceive and respond to certain events that we call stressors, that we appraise as threatening or challenging in some way. How are a stressor and a stress reaction related to stress? So a stressor in terms of um, what do we think, what do we mean by that? To a psychologist, the terrifying truck ride that Ben took was a stressor. What is the stress reaction? Ben's physical and emotional responses were a stress reaction. Stress, what is stress? Um, so the process by which Ben related to the threat was called, well, what is what we conceptualize as stress? How does appraisal of an event affect our stress reaction? So according to psychologist Richard Lazarus, stress arises less from events themselves than from how how we appraise, perceive, or explain them. This is really important um, that it's not so much from the events that we think are causing us stress. It's about our perception of events. It's our perception of what is happening around us that causes the stress. So our thoughts and, um, and our, how we're perceiving whatever the situation is are the thoughts about that situation or what caused the stress. So for example, one person alone in a house ignores its creaking sounds and experiences no stress. Someone else suspects an intruder and becomes alarmed. One person regards a new job as a welcome challenge. Someone else appraises it as a risking failure. So what is stress appraisal? The events of our lives flow through a psychological filter. How we appraise an event influences how much stress we experience and how effectively re we respond. How short-lived or challenging stress, how can short-lived or challenging stress actually have positive outcomes, positive effects? So a momentary stress can mobilize the immune system for feeding off infections, not feeding, <laughs> fending off infections and healing wounds. So a little bit of stress um, can be good can actually have positive outcomes, but of course we don't want it to become extreme and turn into toxic stress. So championship athletes, successful entertainers, motivated students, and great teachers and leaders all thrive and excel when around, aroused by a, a, a particular level of challenge. Experiencing some stress early in life builds resil resilience. But how can extreme or prolonged stress harm us? Stress can trigger risky decisions and unhealthy be behaviors. Pregnant women with overactive stress systems tend to have shorter pregnancies, which pose health risks for their infants. When facing stress, people may be more likely to, to engage in negative behaviors like smoking and drinking. So what are the three main categories of stress? We've got catastrophes, significant life changes, and daily hassles. So catastrophes are unpredictable large-scale events like earthquakes, floods, wildfires, storms, um, 
Worldwide pandemics, <laughs> after such events, damage to emotional and physical health can be significant. This is an image from the devastating 2010 earthquake in Haiti. So how do catastrophes impact physical and emotional health? In the four months after Hurricane Katrina, New Orleans suicide rate reportedly tripled, according to research. In surveys taken in the three weeks after the 9-11 attacks, 58% of Americans said they were experiencing greater than average arousal and anxiety. A similar uptick in health issues from heart problems to suicides immediately followed the 2011 terrorist attacks in Norway. So many significant life changes happen during young adulthood. Life transitions, having a loved one die, a friend moving away, a favorite aunt and uncle getting a divorce are often keenly felt. Even happy events such as graduating from high school or leaving home for college can be stressful life transitions. A Gallup Healthways survey of more than 650,000 Americans during 2008 and 2009 found daily stress highest among younger adults. So you can see it's pretty, pretty big differences there um, between the levels of stress of the different age groups. You can see it drops off as you get older. Daily hassles, what are they? Every day we wake up to alarms that were not set, teachers that require more from us, friends that are in bad moods, and cars that won't start. So we all encounter these daily hassles. Um, they can cover just about anything that impedes your progress on a task, reroutes your plans, causes you aggravation or anxiety. You know, your phone not being charged, having your brother or sister or someone annoy you, too many things to do. Um, these are daily hassles. Um, you know, having to give a public speech or to do a difficult math, math problem, we have, we have lots of daily hassles that interfere and cause us some stress. So what is an example of how stress is studied? So here's one example. So in this study, participants chew gum so that collecting saliva is easy. Researchers take a saliva sample from each participant at the beginning of the experiment to measure level, levels of the stress hormone cortisol. Participants then, um, participants then given simulated job interview speech to a critical panel. <laughs> that doesn't look like fun. Next, the participant is asked to complete difficult math problems out loud. Measuring cortisol in participants' saliva before and after tells us, although they enter the lab experiencing some stress, that level goes up 40% after they experience social stress. So the research team thanks and debriefs the participant, explaining the purpose of the experiment and the role she played. That would be an example of how some of the stress research is conducted. So how do we respond and adapt to stress? When alerted by any number of brain pathways, the sympathetic nervous system arouses us, preparing the body for the adaptive response called fight or flight. It increases our heart rate and respiration, diverts blood from digestion to the skeletal muscle, dulls our feelings and pain of pain, and releases sugars and fat from the body stores. We've all felt that adrenaline rush happen. So physiologists have identified an additional stress response system. Um, so from the orders by the cerebral cortex via the hypothalamus and pituitary gland, the outer part of the adrenal gland secretes glutocorticoid stress hormones such as cortisol. So stress, when I mean, you're thinking about stress hormones, cortisol is what you should be thinking about. Um, what is the general adaptation syndrome? So Canadian scientists, a Canadian scientist 40 years ago, uh, did some research on stress. His studies of animals' reactions to various stressors such as electric so shock and surgery helped make stress a major concept in both psychology and medicine. He proposed that the body's adaptive response to stress is so general that um, you know things that are like burglar alarms, whatever it is, um, we have a reaction. And he named this response the general adap adaptation syndrome. He saw the general adaptation syndrome as a three-phase process of alarm, resistance, and exhaustion. And you can take a second to look at this image up here. Phase one, alarm reaction, mobilizes resource. Phase two, resistance, 
how are we coping with the stressor? And the body's resistance to stress can only last so long. And then when you're really tired, exhausted. I actually just had this happen to me <laughs> yesterday. I had a stressful event happen. Um, everything's fine. Stressful thing happened. And afterwards, I, I felt extraordinarily tired. That phase three set in and I was absolutely exhausted. So what is alarm? In phase one, an alarm reaction occurs as the sympathetic nervous system is act, activated suddenly. The heart rate zooms and blood is diverted from the, to the skeletal muscles. Feelings of faintness or of shock may occur. Resources are mobilized and fight, flight, or freeze is activated. During phase two, resistance, temperature, blood pressure, and respiration remain high. The adrenal glands pump hormones into the bloodstream. All resources are summoned to meet the challenge. As time passes with no relief from stress, the body's reserves begin to dwindle. What is exhaustion? Well, phase three is exhaustion. With exhaustion, the body becomes more vulnerable to illness or even, in extreme cases, collapse and death. If you are taking the AP exam, here's a tip. Be able to differentiate Walter Cannon's fight or flight from the general adaptation syndrome, as this has been asked in prior years on the AP exam. So what are other ways humans respond to stress? We respond to stress in other ways too. One response is common after a loved one's death, withdrawal, pull back, try to conserve energy. Faced with an extreme disaster such as a ship sinking, some people become paralyzed by fear. There are many different ways that people react. What is the tend and befriend response? Um, another found um, often among women is the, to give and receive support, what's called the tend and befriend response. Facing stress, men more often than women tend to withdraw socially, turn to alcohol, or become emotionally insensitive. Women more often respond to stress by nurturing and banding together, what is called the tend and befriend response. So what are health psychology and psychoneuroimmunology? So health psychology is a subfield of psychology that provides psychology's contribution to behavioral medicine. Now psychoneuroimmunology is the study of how psycho psychological, neural, and endocrine processes sort of work together um, and how they affect the immune system and resulting health. So to study how stress and health stress and healthy and unhealthy behaviors influence health and illness, psychologists and physicians created the interdisciplinary field of behavioral medicine, integrating behavioral and medical knowledge. So what do we know? The immune system is a complex surveillance system. When it functions properly, it maintains health by isolating and destroying bacteria, viruses, and other invaders. So you can see this image to the right. Uh, intruders? Is it a bacterial infection? Is it a cancer cell? Is it some other harmful intruder? Are there disease cells that need to be cleared out? Um, this gives you a description of, of it. So the stress response. Four types of cells are activated in searching for and destroying invaders in the body. B and T lymphocytes, macrophages, and, nat and natural killer cells. See the images on them right here? How does stress increase vulnerability to disease? This is really important. Surgical wounds heal more slowly in stressed people. Stressed people are more vulnerable to cold. Stress can hasten the course of a disease. So you probably have heard, you know, being stressed actually weakens your immune system. And that is actually true. Um, especially being stressed over long periods of time, it can significantly weaken your immune system and make you more susceptible to illness. When researchers dropped a cold virus into people's noses, 47% of those living stress-filled lives developed colds. In one experiment, dental students received punch wounds, precise small holes punched in the skin. Compared with wounds placed during summer vacation, those placed three days before a major exam healed much more, 40% more slowly. So again, stress has an effect on our physical health. Stress does not create cancer cells, but in a healthy functioning immune system, lymphocytes, macrophages, and NK cells search out and destroy cancer cells and cancer damaged cells. If stress weakens the immune system, might this weaken a person's ability to fight off cancer? 
So experimenters implanted tumor cells in rodents and gave them carcinogenic substances or cancer producing substances called carcinogens. They then exposed some rodents to uncontrollable stress, such as inescapable shock, which weakened their immune system. Stressed rodents, compared with their unstressed counterparts, developed cancer more often, experienced tumor growth sooner, and grew larger tumors. So what are some of, uh, why are some of us more prone to coronary heart disease than others? About 610,000 Americans die annually from heart disease. High blood pressure and a family history of disease increase the risk. So does smoking, obesity, an unhealthy diet, physical inactivity, and a high cholesterol level. How does stress impact coronary heart disease? Stress and personality play a big role in heart disease. The more psychological trauma people experience, the more their bodies generate inflammation, which is associated with heart and other health problems, including depression. So in a classic study, Meyer Friedman and Ray Rosenman and their colleagues tested the idea that stress increases vulnerability to heart disease by measuring the blood cholesterol level and clotting speed of 40 US male tax accountants at different times of the year. So what did they find? From January through March, the test results were completely normal. But as the accountants began scrambling to finish their clients' tax returns before April, the April 15th filing deadline, their cholesterol and clotting measures rose to dangerous levels. In May and June, with the deadlines passed, the measures returned to normal. But these men stress predicted heart attack risk. So what were the fault, what's follow-up research has been done? So they launched a longitudinal study of more than 3,000 healthy men, ages 35 to 59. The researchers interviewed each man for 15 minutes, noting his work and eating habits, manner of talk, and other behavioral patterns. After the interviews, the subjects were classified as either having type A or type B personalities. What characterizes a type A personality? The subjects in the study were who seemed the most reactive, competitive, hard driving, impatient, time conscious, super motivated, verbally aggressive, and easily angered are called type A. Okay, <laughs> those are the type A people. You may see yourself there or you may see people you know there. Um, type B personality. The roughly equal number of men in Friedman and Rosenman studies who were more easygoing and relaxed were called type B. So what were the findings of the longitudinal study? Nine years later, 257 men had suffered heart attacks and 69% of them were type A. Moreover, not one of the pure type Bs, the most mellow and laid back of their group had suffered a heart attack. Really um, astounding results. So why are type A personalities more prone to coronary heart disease? Further research demonstrates that type A's toxic core is negative emotionality, especially the anger associated with an aggressively reactive temperament. What physiological changes occur when angry? When challenged, our active sympathetic nervous system redistributes blood flow to our muscles, pulling it away from our internal organs. The liver, which normally removes cholesterol and fat from the blood, can't do its job. Thus, Excess cholesterol and fat may continue to circulate in the blood and later get deposited around the heart. Hostility also correlates, interestingly, with other risk factors such as smoking, drinking, and obesity. Does mood impact coronary heart disease? Well, a Harvard School of Public Health research team found pessimistic men at double risk of developing coronary heart disease over a 10-year period. So the term catharsis, you may have heard it. Uh, given the connection between chronic hostility, as in the type A personality, and heart disease, it's clear we need strategies for anger management. In Western cultures, many believe we can achieve emotional release or catharsis through aggressive action or fantasy. But does that actually reduce anger? No, it actually fails to cleanse our rage. More often, expressing anger breeds more anger. For one thing, it may provoke further retaliation, causing a minor conflict to escalate into a major confrontation. For another, expressing anger can magnify anger. What are ways that we can actually use to diffuse anger? Wait, reduce the level of physiological arousal of anger by waiting. What goes up must come down. Find a healthy distraction or support. Calm yourself by exercising, playing an instrument, or talking through it with a friend. Distance yourself. Try to move away from the situation mentally, as if you're watching it from a distance. Does stress cause illness? 
Well, stress may not directly cause illness, but it does make us more susceptible, more vulnerable by influencing our behaviors and physiology. So you can see these different things. Oh, this is a good image to check out. What things release stress hormones. Okay, back to the learning targets. This is a pretty long module. So stress is the process by which we appraise and respond to stressors, which are events that challenge or threaten us. If we appraise an event as challenging, we will be, get, we will be aroused and focused in preparation for success. If we appraise event, an event as a threat, we will experience a stress reaction and our health may suffer. The three main types of stressors are catastrophes, significant life changes, and daily hassles and social stress. So Walter Cannon viewed this stress response as a fight or flight system. Later researchers identified an additional stress response in which the adrenal glands secrete glutocorticosteroid, glutocorticoid, I think I said that wrong earlier, so sorry if I did, stress hormones such as cortisol. Um, it's another hard name for me to pronounce. Hans Sale <laughs> proposed a general three phase, alarm resistance, exhaustion, general adaptation syndrome. And remember, if you're taking an AP exam, you wanna be able to differentiate those two different models. So prolonged stress can damage neurons, hastening cell death. Facing stress, women may have a tend and befriend response. Men may withdraw socially, turn to alcohol or become aggressive. Remember, these are, this isn't across the board. This is just on average what males versus females tend to do more so than the other group. So psychoneuroimmunology is the study of how psychological, neural, and endocrine processes together affect the immune system and resulting health. Stress diverts energy from the immune system. Stress does not cause diseases such as cancer, but by altering our immune functioning, it may make us more vulnerable to diseases and influence their progression. So in the US, coronary heart disease is the number one cause of death. It's been linked with the competitive, hard-driving, impatient, verbally aggressive, and especially anger-prone type A personality. Compared with relaxed, easygoing type B personalities, we're less likely to experience heart disease. Type A people secrete more stress hormones. Catharsis does not work to reduce the anger that can be so harmful to our health, but waiting, distracting, and distancing do. Chronic stress also contributes to persistent inflammation, which is associated with heart and other problems, including depression. And finally, stress may not directly cause illness, but it does make us more vulnerable. Really important to understand that if you're feeling really stressed, try to come up with some techniques or talk to someone about what you can do to reduce your stress because it can actually have an influence on making you more vulnerable to physical problems. Um, and influences our behavior and overall physiology. That is the last slide, so thank you for listening. Take care.